Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, I am here to present just a quick update and welcome on behalf of Kathy Kinlock. As many of you know and may have seen the email that went around, Kathy had some surgery over the summer. Uh, she's not quite cleared to come back to work yet, but uh, her recovery is going well, and we really look forward to having her back just as soon as possible and reconnecting with everyone soon. Uh, she's asked me to share a short message with, uh, with you, which I, I will read because I want to be true to her words and uh, just convey her appreciation for everything you do. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending this year. It's this year's part-time studies dinner. And your return to BCIT and your role over the coming year is very important to our students, your colleagues, and employers in the industry. So I'm particularly sorry to miss this opportunity to personally welcome you back. The real world experience, industry relationships, and understanding that you bring to our students are an important part of BCIT's ability to deliver on our provincial mandate to provide talented workers to BC's key economic sectors. BCIT has approximately 13,000 part-time students enrolled so far for fall 2018 alone. We anticipate that part-time studies will make up over 60% of our total activity over this next year. So that's, that's significant. With rapidly advancing technologies driving the need for ongoing skill upgrades throughout our careers, I believe that part-time studies are going to become even more important to ensuring that BC's, Canada's, and the global workforce can access knowledge and perspective they need to stay current. Post-secondaries must provide accessible and lifelong learning opportunities for mid-career workers who have jobs, families, mortgages, and a key part of the solution is the part-time programs and studies, and BCIT is leading the way, and we can continue to do even better. So again, on behalf of Kathy, thank you for all you do for our students and for meeting this growing need. And this evening, the focus is on you and the support you need. I hope you learn something, you make some connections, you enjoy the evening, and you walk away feeling inspired about the coming year. And, and on behalf of Kathy, she looks forward to connecting with you soon. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. And of course, we all offer our, con our um, best wishes to Kathy as she recovers. Uh, I'm, I'm told I'm supposed to stand here, which is not me. For those of you that know me, I'm a walker and a talker, and so I'm trying to freeze myself here. Next up, I'd like to introduce Mr. Tom Romer, our VP Academic, who's going to give you some updates. Thank you, Donna. Appreciate it. For you PTS instructors, you might find that model on the right most interesting. When we uh, talked to people in the market, both employers and employees, they said, uh, the PTS courses are excellent. They really convey a lot of knowledge in a short time. What they also allow us to do is take PTS courses in different fields. So I can, for example, let's say I have a small company and I realize I need a little bit of understanding in accounting. So I take an accounting or tax accounting course and then I maybe take something a little bit in HR and maybe I take something in patent law, which normally you don't find in a particular program. And I can do that whenever I have the time because the PTS courses are, of course, scheduled in a flexible format. And employers really like it because they said we have uh, two types of employees, some who are hugely specialized in their field, but then there's a new cadre of employee coming up that's sort of a bit of a generalist that has to know about more areas. And so we try to address that. Now, the the shortfall of that model is that it doesn't lead to any kind of an academic recognition. So every time you might finish, as a, as a student, you might finish a uh, PTS course, you get a certificate of completion, for example, and that's it. So if you were now a, a person applying for a job, you would say, yeah, I had these 17 courses. They are technically all unrelated, but I can't really say I have now a diploma level standing, or I have an advanced diploma level standing. So what we want to do, and we work together with Humber College in Ontario on that, we would like to introduce what we call an open interdisciplinary credential. It's 
just an idea at the moment. But what it means is when you have taken enough PTS courses uh, that accumulate, let's say, 30 credits, then you can apply for a certificate in interdisciplinary studies that recognizes that you have now achieved the knowledge or the academic standing, if you want, that would be equivalent to somebody who took a one-year engineering program or a, a one-year technical program. It's just saying, okay, you have that, if you were a 21, 22-year-old, you would say you have that kind of uh, academic maturity. It's a little bit tricky when you have somebody uh, with 45 or 50-year-old taking courses and you speak about the term maturity. So it's really more like a knowledge level where we say you would have about that knowledge level. What that allows us to do in the long run is pick courses from all different areas. It's not one of these everything goes. There will be a certain uh, rule around that. There has to be a little bit of disciplines what you can use, but it tries to marry the academic achievement, the recognition on the part of BCIT that you have actually an academic achievement while keeping the flexibility of the PTS structure alive. So that's a bit of a new approach. We uh, ran it by a few employers. They loved it. They loved especially the idea of using that framework for their own professional development programs. So they say, well, we could then have BCIT as a partner. Here's a catalog of PTS courses. We send our people in. But then two, three years later, when they have accumulated uh, 30 credits, we can say, congratulations, you now have a certificate. Or you have a diploma, maybe even an advanced diploma. So that, that's what we're working on right now. It uh, is not uh, supposed to do uh, anything away with respect to our cohort model, but it's supposed to give more recognition to PTS so that, that, that people don't have that feeling it's maybe disjointed or something. That's the exact, uh, what, we, what we try to say is no, this is simply a catalog of courses where you can choose from and they also lead to academic recognition. And that would hopefully then find its way into the PTS review as well. All right, and I think that, yeah, so that, that's pretty much it. The idea then is that you would get a, an interdisciplinary certificate after 30 credits, an interdisciplinary diploma. You know that most universities don't have anything uh, during three, after three years, there's a bit of a gap in between. We try to fill that gap with an interdisciplinary advanced diploma. And I put the interdisciplinary bachelors up there. Okay. Let, let, let's walk first before we run, but I said that would be, of course, in, uh, in a few years, hopefully where we could go. And we'll see if the market adopts that and says, yeah, okay, so here's a person with a very broad skill set, but they have that level of uh, bachelors. And with that, if I'm not totally mistaken, oh, there we have that. Uh, the benefits of that model are flexible timetabling, customizable interdisciplinary skill sets. It's a complement for industrial professional development frameworks. You might have heard that word badges. That's sort of a bit of a new trend out there. It's a competency-based recognition. Uh, competency level evaluation of skills. So if somebody comes now, let's say from the armed forces, or yeah, let's use the armed forces or from the paramedics, it's very difficult to compare their skills against the program, against, against a two-year credential. But we can definitely uh, compare it against competency. So we can give them a recognition that they can continue to work in their academic career. Recognition of academic standing is what I mentioned. Progressive credentialing, the four years. Open academic orientation, so people can go whichever way they like, and then mobility and transfer with other polytechnic institutions. And that, Donna, I think is it. I, yes, it is indeed. <laughs> All right, last comment. Uh, you might find when the uh, education plan comes out, you might find that term smart cities and sustainable communities. That's a little bit the theme that we want to give the uh, education plan for the next three years. Uh, virtually everything fits under that umbrella, but it's a little bit easier for the general public to understand than saying we are a polytechnic institute. So you have a bit of a tangible uh, direction where you can say we support anything that deals with a smart city or a sustainable community. It's, it's semi-philosophical, but it works. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Tom. That's exciting stuff, you know, but after being here so many years to see the opportunity to have those interdisciplinary studies makes me very, very happy. 
So our next presenter is actually very new. So I'm not screwing up this time. Rather than being here three years, she's literally been here three days. So be kind. Uh, Alison <laughs> Neusbaumer is our new Director of Library Services. So I just invite her to come up and introduce herself and say a few words. Well, you stole my thunder. Uh, <laughs> I was going to brag about three days of experience. Uh, however, I just want to say, uh, relating to the theme of interdisciplinariness, that the library is really a labor laboratory for that. Uh, we represent all of the uh, disciplines, all of the courses and programs here at BCIT, and we are encouraging our students certainly to work together in new and creative ways, and I know that that comes with our faculty as well. So, just thought I'd make that plug. Anyway, uh, so I'm very privileged to be the new Director of Library Services here. I think BCIT is a very exciting place and I'm glad to join the community. You might want to know, well, why? How come she's here? What was it that drew me? What drew me was my perception of the energy and the innovation and the creativity and the commitment of the library staff and of the faculty and of the students at BCIT. I really, uh, searching, doing my research on it and from things that I know from having previously lived in British Columbia, I uh, had a very strong positive desire to work here. So in the library, we foster hands-on learning, growth and creativity in our students and we support you to reach your teaching and learning goals. So I want you to lose the image of the library being a place just for books. We still have some, but we have so much more. So, for example, you might want to insert library resources into the learning space, the DL2. And you could book time and work with a librarian and get assistance into uh, things that would work well for your courses, things of interest to your students, and even um, tools for assistance to help them with research projects. We also have, well, actually, sorry, I'm going to back up a little bit because I've lost my point in my notes. Um, there's so many things, but you're not going to retain them all, you know, and I don't want to sit here droning on and on, and I did not have time to make slides. So I want you to take away two things, and I'll remind you of those at the end. The first thing is ask. There are so many ways to ask for assistance in the library. You can ask via email, you can send a text, you can go through online chat, you can come face to face, you can meet me in the hallway, you can come to my office, you can even stick a post-it note on us in the cafeteria if you like. But asking is going to open the doors to you to all the resources that you have available that are going to support you in your own teaching and some of you in your research as well. The other thing I really want you to walk away with is going to the website. BCIT.ca slash library. I just spent a whole day cruising through the website to get ready for this little talk, and I know that it's very well designed, extremely easy to find the information. And if you can think of the question, you're probably going to find the answer on the BCIT library website. So walk away with those two things. So I'm just going to briefly address the basics, where we are, what we have, and what we do. Where we are, there are three campus libraries. The main one being the largest and open the most hours is here at Burnaby. We also have uh, library services in the Aerospace Technology Campus and the Marine Campus. One thing in terms of where we are, I don't know if you know, but there is an office for PTS people to come into in the library. It's a shared office that you can use 24-7. Those of you who were here last year or previous years were used to finding it uh, on the second floor of the library, which is a bit confusing because it's actually the main entrance. But this office has moved downstairs to the lower level and that gives you 24 seven access. So when you want that office, it's there even after you finish teaching your classes. So the resources that we have, well, we have a lot of them. We have many formats, we have print, we have digital, we have electronic, we have streaming media. But probably what you'll end up using the most is the 24 seven access that you get to electronic resources, journals and databases, eBooks, streaming video and digitized content. I heard that some of you are interested in a resource called lynda.com. 
So lynda.com, I gather, was being offered in some departments and some parts of campus, and then people would talk about it at coffee, and then somebody else didn't have it and wanted to know about it. And so the library took it over in terms of centralizing that money and opening it up to everybody. So you can access it just going through the website. So lynda.com is essentially a huge database of videos where you can learn. And it runs the gamut from beginner introductory resources to super advanced. It ranges in length. You can find videos. Uh, the one I found, for example, was 43 minutes for an introduction to virtual reality. Well, guess what? Didn't have 43 minutes because I had to prepare for this. So I was able to save it to my playlist. I was looking around for other kinds of videos, and you can do an entire course. So for example, I found a course for nine hours on 3D Max, tips, tricks, and techniques, rated intermediate. I did not save that one to my list. <laughs> the beauty about the playlist is the fact that if you're browsing around and finding things, you can put them in there and you can go back and use them when you want to. It also keeps track of where you are. So you get all going and you think, yes, I have the 43 minutes. No, a student walks in. And you have to put it aside. It'll save the information where you left it off. And since I have a relatively captive audience, I'm going to mention one other resource that we have that's relatively new and I think that you will find very useful and your students will as well. And it's called Safari Business and Technical Books. It's a collection of online ebooks. There's over 50,000 ebooks on all kinds of topics and conference videos and video courses. It covers business, digital media, IT and software development, math, science, engineering, and personal and professional development. So really, access through the website, need help, ask. These resources are going to make your time here so much more interesting and fulfilling. Finally, what do we do? What do all these people in the library do? Well, we have public services staff who are really there to serve you with uh, things like interlibrary loan. If there's something you want and we don't have it, we might be able to get it from UBC or SFU or someone else. Course reserves, if there's something your students need to look at and they haven't, we haven't got it or it's something unique or uh, could be e-reserves, could be uh, physical reserves, we can set that up for you. Uh, we circulate the materials, so we do still check out those books, but we also check out laptops and e-readers, adapters, power cords, and uh, battery charges. Yes, we can save you. Uh, we also have things like archives, which are quite specialty. And did you know you can go there when you have time and find your picture in the yearbook? Yes, the whole collection is in the archives. We have a copyright office. The website offers fabulous information on copyright. I have to say that because I'm supposed to know a lot about copyright, but I'm learning. <laughs> so go to the website, and if not, come to me, and we will figure out what you need to know. We have an information repository, and that's something that's very unique to individual institutions. So BCIT's inform uh, information repository has theses that have been done by BCI students, and it has uh, research articles that have been published by BCIT faculty. So it's a really good place just to see what your colleagues are doing. We have a writing center that helps students a lot uh, with citations and how to frame up their arguments in, in writing a paper. And lastly, we have a learning commons. Now this is something that you, I would like you to be able to refer your students to. If you have a student who's struggling, particularly early in the semester, you can tell them to go down to the library and book an appointment with a peer tutor. These are other students that have been highly trained and very successful who will work in small groups with students or can book a one-on-one -on -one session for a slight fee. And what we've heard is that students feel very comfortable learning in that environment, asking questions, getting a way to sort of see it in the way they haven't seen it before. So we really encourage that. We have media specialists in this marvelous space called Media Works. So this is quite new, and if you were here last year, I think it was down in the basement. It has now moved up to the second floor. There's a dedicated VR room. There's assistance and support for 3D printing. You can create podcasts there. You can develop AR and VR after you've watched your 43-minute video from lynda.com. You can use large format printers. 
and you can do things like audiovisual editing. It's a fabulous resource and it really is pushing BCIT ahead of the curve in terms of what's available just for students and for you, the instructors. And lastly, but not least, our librarians do all kinds of things. And one of the things they do is called subject liaison. And that means they work closely with your departments, with the faculty, to find out the kind of resources you need for your instruction and for your students. They also can meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. They can help you embed those resources, like I said earlier, into the online learning platform. And if you are interested in doing research, they can help you get started on that as well. They're a fabulous resource, and again, you can contact them in many different ways. And finally, they're going to help you help your students integrate information and digital literacy skills into all that they do. So, thank you for the time. Hope to see you in the library. Not bad for three days indeed, Tom. That was uh, very well done. Oh, no, my notes are gone. Have you got my notes by any oh, chance whatsoever? Yes, just take it all in mind. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm just going to tell a quick story before I introduce Craig. I have a seven, or I had a seven-year-old granddaughter. She's 14 now. And I have a tendency of always saying, I wonder if blah, blah, blah. I wonder if blah, blah, blah. And Alyssa said to me one day, Grandma, you've got Google. You don't need to wonder anymore. You can just look it up. <laughs> That's what lynda.com is for me. And I tell you, in the registrar's office, when we sit around and we think, I wonder, blah, 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 lynda.com is the first place we go. So thank you for bringing that on. And uh, I really, really encourage everybody to reach out because it is an amazing resource. Our next presenter today is Craig, Craig Sijak. Craig is our Director of Campus Development. So he's going to uh, update us on some stuff that's going on in the big picture in this place. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I've been asked to give a really brief overview of all the work we've been doing over the past couple of years. Um, the campus plan is really intended to provide a framework to enable the education plan as we get funding for new buildings to be realized in an ordered and strategic way. It also provides us sort of the long-term vision for the Institute looking 50 years out. We've gone through a long process and we um, you know, lots of uh, consultation with the campus community, lots of ideas. We've distilled that into a, a campus plan document that uh, our Board of Governors approved in May, which is a major milestone. They've endorsed it and, uh, and allow us now to move on to the next phase, which is the... So we're, we're getting ready to move to the City of Burnaby approval process so that we can actually implement changes to our official community plan for the Institute. Some guiding principles in the framework. Um, one of the, the key things is you want to make the campus a pedestrian focused campus and really direct vehicle traffic to the perimeter. So a key element of the plan is, is, um, is instituting a ring road on the perimeter so that as people arrive on campus they can get into the parking facilities quickly and then the rest of the heart of the campus is focused on a walkable um, environment. And the Institute is really a remnant of two different institutions, BCIT and um, PVI. So they ne were never properly stitched together. And so a lot of the planning is around creating the pedestrian routes north, south, east, west through uh, the campus lands. So the ring road is uh, sort of indicated with the red. Um, and then you can see the orange and green our north-south pedestrian spines. The green with the blue dashed line actually is a very significant move for the campus. It's the um, proposed daylighting of the northern section of Gishon Creek, which becomes both a walking route but a key ecological and social amenity for the campus. As part of the plan, we've also been looking at sort of parts of the campus and defining some key character areas. Um, in this diagram, the reddish area is really the campus core, but within that, um, one of the key areas is what we're calling the yard, which is really a focus on the, the trades area and creating a sort of an outdoor um, public amenity space, pedestrian-focused space, but where we can really put a lot of the interesting things that are going on inside buildings, kind of display it to the, to the whole campus community. And the corner of Canada Way and Willingdon is also envisioned as the real um, sort of main street where we might introduce additional commercial services and potentially some mixed-use development. 
so I also wanted to, you know, you're probably arriving on campus, you're seeing lots of digging going on right now, and that's related to the North Campus Infrastructure Project. And with this project, it's allowing us to actually move forward and implement portions of the plan. So the first representation of that is Cary Street, where you can see um, the roads being put back and there's landscaping, new sidewalks. We're going to have a bike lane along there. Um, the other picture with the gravel there is that's the future pedestrian spine. They'll be going right up the heart of campus and that's um, in the next couple months that'll be closed in and start to be able to be used by the community. This is an artist rendering of the yard area. So really transforming it from a, basically a parking lot to a pedestrian focused plaza. Gishon Creek, this is just an artist rendering of, of the type of transformation that could occur as we open up that culvert and, and transform it into a, an active, open, environmentally sensitive space. And this is an artist rendering of what could occur at the corner of Willingdon and Canada Way, retail, probably some event space, maybe some rental housing, office space, potentially hotel space, that kind of scale. We're also looking at the recreational facilities on campus and student housing, and really trying to make it more efficiently laid out, optimize the opportunities on campus, and really add vitality to the campus. We've got a, an approved project, the Health Sciences Center. So this is approved by the provincial government. And we've, uh, we're actually in the design phase now. So this is the first building that really starts to implement the plan. The yellow squ squares represent future projects. The first um, priority is the trades and technology building at the corner of Cary and uh, Canada Way. And then there's a series of other projects. And here's some artist renderings of what those spaces, those buildings could become. Trades and technology on the left, and then another building called the uh, Center for Ecological Restoration and Climate Adaptation are, are sort of our one, two projects in upcoming. And then there's also the student hub that's um, partially funded through a student association referendum, and the Learning and Information Center, which is a new building that would replace a lot of facilities, aged facilities on campus. And all this information is provided in much more detail on our website. So if you're interested, go check it out. Thank you. Well, that's pretty exciting too. Wow, we're just full of exciting news tonight. It's going to be great to see some new buildings on this old baby. And, uh, <laughs> don't know that I'll still be around to see it, but uh, I'll certainly be here watching them dig that first hole for the Trades and Technology Center, that's for sure. So again, I thank you very much for spending some time with us this evening and uh, take the opportunity to have a bite to eat, do some networking, and then go in and uh, see your program and school presentations. Meet your dean, your associate deans, or whoever they're sending uh, as their delegates and get some key information about your school and program to help you along your way. So again, if you need anything, Office of the Registrar is always open. Come on down and see me. I'm sure any of these folks are more than willing to answer any questions that you've got uh, if you want. And have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thanks for coming, folks. Bye-bye. <laughs>